How do you check? Check, 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 check. Mic check one two, mic check one two. 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 My check one two, my check one two, check, check. My check one two, my check one two. My check one two, my check one two. My check one two, my check one two, two.
Well, I think we've kept you waiting long enough. Again, good morning and welcome to the uh, Wilson Center. As I said, I'm Kent Hughes. I'm a public policy scholar here and for many years ran a program here on America and the global economy or at one point really science technology. Pardon me? Oh, I don't know. Hello? Is it up? Do you? Great. I think it's working now. Thank you. Uh, as, as I said, Kent Hughes, public policy scholar here at the Wilson Center. Welcome and good morning. We've got a really stimulating two hours ahead of us. Let me uh, first introduce you not only to myself, but much more to the Wilson Center. For those of you that are new to us, the Wilson Center was established by the Congress in 1968 as what they called a living memorial to Woodrow Wilson. They had debated how they wanted to honor the president and thought about a monument, thought about a marble statue, and instead decided on what they called, as I said, a living memorial. Wilson was the only president who had a PhD and in his era was quite a prominent political scientist. He went on, of course, to be governor of New Jersey and then a two-term president. So what the assignment that Congress gave us was to bring together both sides of those lives, the people doing the best thinking on aspects of public policy together with people who were making or influencing policy. And we do that at the center in a two basic ways. Over a course of a year, we'll have some 150 people that come to do research here on one aspect of policy and other. Uh, in the modern era, and what our uh, new president, Jane Harmon, would refer to as Wilson Center 3.0, we really are much more aligned together. That is, the programmatic activity and the scholarship are really more closely aligned. We also have programs that literally cover the world. Every region in the world, with the exception of Antarctica, has a program that looks at the interaction of policy and politics and economics and so forth. And then there are some cross-cutting programs, and we certainly encourage that. Energy, environment, economics, and so forth that really cut across and are in most cases embedded in a global reality. The, uh, this morning, we have a great pleasure to welcome back STIPI, the Science Technology Policy Institute. It's our second time that we've had the pleasure of hosting STIPI. The first time was the focus on trends, global trends, and advanced manufacturing, something that is of great interest here and really everywhere around the world. And I've seen some of this leapfrogging firsthand that 3D printing, which not long ago was a fairly new subject of public discussion, has really blossomed and is now showing up in schools. I thought it was impressive that at a first robotics competition in South Florida, there were three teams that were printing parts with 3D printers. Just on a trip, one of my fellow travelers uh, studies the, uh, at really the NATO, talked about his daycare center for his five-year-old, where they have a 3D printer just to get the young people started on the right path. I mean, this is clearly a world in which I feel incre increasingly left behind. Well, this morning we're going to focus on one of the critical aspects of the world's future and certainly of America's future, and that's the question of innovation and innovation systems. We have the pleasure now of hosting the, the, our second time a really very stimulating Stippy report looking at the innovation systems in Brazil, Russia, and South Korea. And in each case, they ask the question of, what can we learn? What are the opportunities here? At the same time, what are the challenges that are posed to a world in which everyone, almost everyone, is focused on developing and perfecting and improving their own capacity for innovation? And to get us started this morning, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Lewis. Uh, Mark is currently the director of STIPI. Uh, previously at the University of Maryland, he was a chaired professor in aerospace engineering, in the aerospace engineering department, which proves to me that this kind of study does in fact require a rocket scientist. He uh, was also the chief scientist for the Air Force for a record number of years. He has an enormous range of papers. He was the president of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astro, uh, Astronautics. And I, before I 
go any further and feel even more intimidated, let me welcome Mark Lewis to the, to the stage. Great to have you back. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Ken, as always, your, your gracious hospitality in hosting us is, is very much appreciated. And I also want to thank uh, Larry Gershwin from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and, and his outstanding team, who really got us started along this track and posed the questions that I, I think you'll uh, formulate, led to the formulation of the, the discussion that you'll be hearing this morning. Um, if I could say a few words about, about uh, the Science Technology Policy Institute, STIPI, uh, very much like the Wilson Center, we were chartered by Congress, although we were not char chartered to honor an individual's memory so much as uh, a concern in the early 90s about America's place in the world and its continued uh, competitiveness with the rise of, of Asia as, as a technological power. Um, STIPI is the executive branch's federally funded research and development center, FFRDC. And that means we work with the White House, especially the Office of Science Technology Policy, National Science Foundation, National Science Board, range of executive branch agencies uh, to uh, address topics of interest uh, ranging from energy and environment to space policy to issues uh, related to nanotechnology, innovation, uh, pretty full spectrum. Um, we've got a, a very talented team of individuals, and I think the, the hallmark of what we do is to bring uh, individuals with different perspectives together, different backgrounds, engineering, science, sociology, economics, psychology, law, bring them together to address a, a topic that may be of interest to our, our sponsor. Um, our topic today is innovation. And of course, this is on the tip of everyone's tongue in Washington, D.C. Driving in this morning, I heard no fewer than three advertisements on WTOP from companies claiming to be innovative. So I think this is a, a, an issue that, that, is, that we're all concerned about, all interested in, and all asking the question, what, what makes uh, an individual, a company, a country innovative? Um, you will be hearing about three countries uh, this morning, and, and, and a, a bit of a disclaimer. I, I think we could have a morning session on any one of these three countries. In fact, I think we could have a two-day seminar on any one of these countries. So bringing them all together, of course, is, is a daunting task and a monumental task. And so apologies, I think what, what we'll be presenting is, is somewhat of a smattering, a, 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 a taste of some of the things that we've uncovered in our study. Um, to lead off our discussion uh, uh, will be Nayani Gupta, who's one of our uh, distinguished research staff members at, at uh, STIPI. Uh, Nayani came to STIPI with a tremendous background in science and policy. Uh, she actually worked at the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center uh, at, uh, for part of her career, was at the Congressional Research Service. Uh, Nayani has a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the Indian Institute of Technology. Uh, she has master's degrees in chemistry, materials engineering from North Carolina State and uh, University of Maryland at College Park. And uh, sh in addition, she has a master's degree in international policy and practice from the George Washington University. So without further ado, uh, Nayani, would you please join us and begin our discussion? Thank you all. I'm sorry. No, no, this is the same as the business bulletin. Um, is this camera on? Oh, you can bring it back. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate um, your presence here this morning. Um, we are going to talk about South Korea, Russia, and Brazil and their innovation story and how it all plays into the race for the future. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge my, uh, the team that worked on it. I'm presenting on behalf of a number of people, James Herrera, Sarah Nash, Vanessa Pena, Stephanie Schick, and Christopher Weber. And we spent, um, a fair number of months learning uh, about these countries and understanding, trying to understand their innovation strategy. But as Mark said, 
Um, there's a lot that we learned, and we've really had to condense a lot of our learning to present in an hour. So what I'm going to do is primarily go over um, the countries in some, in, in very little detail, but look at the overarching trends that are true across the different countries. So, um, and now I have to wait for my slides, sorry. Um, can I just sit and use the... Okay, that's fine, okay. So um, I'll start with a brief background and look at and just introduce the study questions, go over our methodology in, um, in some detail. Then we start with a look at innovation systems, what they mean for different countries and how different countries um, build their innovation systems and, and try to succeed in them. As I mentioned, I will uh, describe the national innovation systems of South Korea, Russia, and Brazil in, in some um, detail. And then finally, the second half of the talk looks at overarching trends across the three countries. So um, our sponsor in the ODNI asked Stiffy to look at innovation policies in the three countries, specifically what are the drivers behind a country's innovation goals, what are the mechanisms and the strategies that the countries use to execute their innovation policies, uh, what are some of the trends that are important for innovation and that indicate the effectiveness of innovation policies, and um, socio-cultural and historical characteristics of a population that are important for innovation. Um, so our study is largely based on structured discussions with country experts. We had discussions with experts across nonprofits, industry, government, and academia. And our, um, our effort was to try to speak with people that are in those countries. So we have tried to talk to folks that either live or work or have worked in each of these three countries, whether or not they live um, there now. And uh, we also substantiated with a survey of open literature and used a number of data sources to, um, to get quantitative information to back up our findings. Um, so innovation is fairly well defined and we like um, the OECD definition which stresses the introduction of a new or a product or process and its introduction to the marketplace and how it influences the economy through the commercialization of a product or a process. But when you think of national innovation systems, our challenge was that the three countries that we looked at think of their innovation systems in very different ways. And the three countries are also very different countries. So after looking um, through some literature, we came up with a framework where we describe a country's innovation system in terms of its endowment, which include its geography and natural resources, its, its historical um, traditions, and the culture of its people and their propensity for innovation types of activities. We looked at how governments leverage these endowments, and this would be in terms of policies that um, increase uh, the quality of infrastructure, that build up the human capital and knowledge generation, and that create a business-friendly environment. And finally, we look at firms and how they leverage the endowments, both directly as well as through the policies that governments come up with. Ultimately, innovation is a firm-centric activity. And so our study uh, is going to emphasize that how firms look at innovation, firm interest in innovation, and firm investment in innovation ultimately is a big decider of how strong a country's national innovation systems are as well. So now I get into the three country studies, South Korea, Russia, and Brazil. The first um, is South Korea. So as the picture shows, South Korea has seen a very rapid rise in the last 50 years. It has uh, moved from a country with a 
uh, per capita income on par with the lowest, um, with the, the poorest economies and moved past the EU in the past couple of years and is a very prosperous um, country that's leading the OECD on several indicators um, now. A quick look at South Korea's economy. Its uh, GDP per capita is, uh, is at 32,000. The industry is dominated by big business houses or conglomerates. They're also called the Chebol. The top, the top uh, companies are Samsung, Hyundai, the Pohang Iron and Steel Company, and LG Electronics. Some of these are household names. And they are also leaders in their field in innovation and technological sophistication. Um, the South Korean industry is very top heavy. Um, the top 30 companies account for over 80% of the exports. And they have leadership in certain select sectors, information technology, steel, automotive, shipbuilding, and consumer electronics. Um, most of the industry is, uh, much of the big industry is high value added. On the flip side, their service industry is relatively small and weak compared to um, their standing in the OECD, as well as the small and medium enterprises are relatively weak compared to the technological sophistication of the large companies for wh with whom they interact and to whom they supply. South Korea's innovation policy has been a top-down industrial policy. The companies that are leading now were um, handpicked in the 1960s by the then government. Um, South Korea has had a very rapid rise following a strategy of um, following a strategy of very close business ties with industry of directed credit. Thank you. Directed credit, um, trade and uh, investment restrictions, as, and all of this underpinned by consistent investments in R&D and an export orientation from the very beginning. In the 1960s and early 70s, the National uh, Institutes of Science and Technology were established. The next 10 to 20 years saw a very close uh, collaboration between the public research institutes and private industry. In the late 80s, the private sector started taking the lead in R&D spending, and the companies have continued to invest significantly um, on their own. The, the, the five-year science and technology basic plans are their main instrument for um, funding R&D and innovation, and they also have, pa in parallel, a consistent focus on developing the workforce. Okay. So on the output side, South Korea is considered to be an innovation success story. It has moved up the value chain, starting with reverse engineering or import substitution, to a fast follower position where it has um, been competing, but not in the leading position with, globally, uh, with the global leaders, to now the first, a first mover position where it's neck and neck with industry leaders in, uh, in their own leadership sectors. And this has come with high levels of private R&D investment. Um, uh, the conglomerate business structure of South Korean companies gives them a big advantage in that um, the conglomerate structure is many business entities sort of combined in one through complex financial arrangements. And this allows uh, any of the sub-companies to access financial resources, human resources, or many other kinds of resources at short notice when they need it. And, and this can be very advantageous when trying to move ahead um, in the market. South Korea has fused bi Western business practices with the traditional um, Japanese model of manufacturing that they um, have followed. And finally, they have taken some risky bets, and this is in comparison with their Japanese rivals. Um, a large part of the leadership comes through their investment in manufacturing, which is among the top in the world, as you can see, from the plot on the right side. And um, some, just some numbers on the right side to give you a sense. Uh, South Korea was recently ranked number two in innovation behind the United States by a Bloomberg innovation ranking. Most Many of its companies are the largest in their sector, both in market cap as well as in the amount that they spend on R&D and technological sophistication. Moving on to Russia. Russia's economy <laughs> is mostly in its 
natural gas and oil uh, resources. Um, it has the highest reserves of natural gas and oil in the world. Most of the civilian industry is in um, state-owned enterprises. Um, these are large and inefficient enterprise uh, companies which do not do much for uh, innovation in the economy. M outside of this, in the civilian economy, the domestic manufacturing sector is mostly in low value-added goods. Um, a legacy of the Soviet era is that R&D and technology development activities are very weakly linked to production. And this um, impacts the innovation system because for all it, for having a very high and sophisticated science and technology uh, human capital, Russia is very weak in production-related activities, commercialization-related um, strengths, such as marketing and advertising and business skills. The, uh, just to give a point of reference, the manufacturing value added of high-tech products in Russia is about half of that of Brazil and about a seventh of what China produces. But on the other hand, the knowledge intensive and service sectors, especially those that are dependent on information technology, are relatively strong compared to its traditional manufacturing. Um, so Russia's innovation policy um, focuses on top-down creation of innovation zones and uh, which are somewhat isolated and not linked to the larger production economy. Uh, Russia obviously saw a big break in the early 1990s when the Soviet era dissolved and um, innovation and S&P activity in the Soviet era was primarily for military purposes. Um, some of that has transitioned into the private sector, but overall there's been a significant brain drain and emigration of scientists and engineers outside um, out, out of Russia. From the 2000s onwards, um, the government started uh, this um, sort of the recent efforts at uh, regenerating its S&P infrastructure and trying to support innovation through top-down um, strategic policies, creation of special zones, programs to attract foreign scientists to universities. There isn't a very high anticipation of success of these, po of these policies. So on the output side, the story of Russia is that innovation where it happens, happens despite the, gov despite the role of the government and not because of. And the reason for this goes uh, somewhat beyond the policies. So the legacy of the, so and, and because of the legacy of the Soviet era, where during the Soviet era it was illegal um, to own private property and to commercialize any intellectual property, because of the lack of this tradition, despite, um, excuse me, despite a very high level of scientific talent, the market mechanisms that are needed in the um, domestic commercial sector to support competitiveness and um, innovation are missing, are, or are very, very immature. So the domestic commercial sector um, is reported by experts to not have the capacity and the sophistication that's required to support an innovative and competitive economy. By all the indicators of innovation that are commonly used in measurement today, Russia's uh, drivers for mechanism, uh, driver mechanisms for innovation, such as competition and customer demand, are weak. Um, mechanisms for transitioning technology out of the research institutions to the marketplace, such as research industry linkages, are weak. And finally, the framework, framework conditions that support all this activity, such as trade and tax laws, intellectual property protection, cost of doing business, et cetera, are weak and not conducive to businesses. Um, another um, sort of big factor is uh, corruption is pervasive in the economy. So all of this uh, put together, uh, on the output side, what you see is <coughs> that the business interest and the business investment in R&D related um, economic activity is extremely low. Most of the technology development is through acquisition and uh, purchase of technology and machinery from overseas. And so innovation, when it does happen, happens either by adapting to these conditions on the ground, such as many multinationals are doing in Russia, or it happens in industries with a very small footprint 
such as information technology, where which, which is the one place where there is a strong and growing uh, bottom-up innovation economy, which is growing actually with almost no intervention, good or positive or negative, from the government. Moving on to Brazil. Brazil's economy is the largest in Latin America. It has the sixth uh, largest nominal GDP in the world. Um, it, is a, uh, it has a very, very strong and well-developed uh, business economy, as well as a manufacturing base. It is, Brazil is also rich in natural resources. Many of its uh, strong sectors are natural resource dependent. It is strong in oil and gas and deep sea exploration, um, agriculture, mining, biofuels. It is also, um, it has strong industries in aircraft manufacture, automotive equipment and machinery. So Brazil has innovated, um, I'm sorry, Brazil has implemented innovation policies fairly recently. And um, starting in 1999, when the sectoral funds for science and technology, and this would be under um, the one of the recent administrations, the sectoral funds were about the first uh, funding instrument for activities that involved innovation and research and development in science and technology. A quick succession of policies has followed. Some of them have built on previous attempts and some not. And this has led um, experts to call this whole um, uh, attempt a patchwork of policies, some of it not very well coordinated. Uh, the one other thing I want to point out are the last three uh, goals, the Greater Brazil Plan, the Greater IT Plan, the Business Innovation Plan have been uh, implemented by the recent research administration. These are um, high, uh, funded at much higher levels. They are much more overarching. However, they are too recent to um, make a call on how successful or not they are, they are today or they will be. So, so far, just based on everything that has happened, what one could say is that the innovation laws and policies have had a mix, mixed impact. The one big positive has been in education across the board from the elementary level to the PhD level. There has been a doubling or a significant increase in um, the acquiring of education in, um, in both, actually in both the well-developed parts of the economy as well as across um, the, the larger regions of Brazil. Uh, the number of PhDs has doubled over the past decade. As you can see from the picture on the right, um, today you have about 250,000 uh, PhDs, uh, uh, sorry, researchers. And the one thing about um, the PhD graduation rates increasing is that traditionally, uh, overwhelmingly PhDs prefer to join academia over um, industry. Part of it is because of a cultural bias towards pure research conducted in universities, and partly it is because there is a low demand for researchers and um, high quality research in industry, and that is something that policies have not made an impact on yet. So the, the third bullet uh, speaks to that business innovation and interest in innovation in the business sector remains unchanged um, since the implementation of policies. The successful sectors such as agriculture, oil and gas, and others who do conduct R&D, their success precedes the innovation policy. Elsewhere, technology acquisition and adaptation is the mode uh, for most of the industry, whether the larger industries or the smaller medium ones. And interest in R&D-based innovation continues to be low. Um, there are two main reasons for this. The first is the very high cost of doing business in Brazil. Uh, at one point in the early 2000s, the tax rate of it was about 70%. Um, labor laws are inflexible in terms of hiring and firing employees, in terms of the benefits given to employees. And across the board, um, the conditions are, do not allow Brazilian firms to be competitive, um, which is a, a frustration that is heard um, from Brazilian experts. Another factor is the protectionist policies that the Brazilian government has historically implemented in response to foreign competition. This is a huge in disincentive to private firms to uh, invest in risk, uh, high risk 
or long-term R&D strategies. And so overall, the sense is Brazil's industry is growing, the economy is doing well, because Brazil is the dominant uh, economy of South America, and as the South American uh, population comes out of poverty, uh, the Brazilian uh, economy is, is prospering along with it. However, the industry is not necessarily getting more competitive or more innovative. So with this, we come to where um, I'd like to compare some trends across the five countries. Again, each of these um, is the subject of a full talk, but given the lack of time, what I'd like to do is touch very quickly on how each of these um, characteristics or each of these factors play into a country's um, being able to successfully innovate and where the three, these three countries fall um, with, with respect to each of these factors. <coughs> so here are some, um, uh, this, this echoes some of the experts' views that we heard about how social cultural characteristics influence attitudes towards innovation. South Korea is a very homogenous society in ethnicity, language, culture, and so forth. On the other hand, Brazil and Russia um, have a very diverse population. Um, the South Korean society, because of the homogeneity, is a consensus-based society. And um, the one thing they have tried to do is actively uh, work against that or out counteract that by looking outward and trying to assimilate um, external opinions, external knowledge. They send students um, all over the world to study. They send their executives all over the world to get trained and to absorb global opinions. Um, and so um, the other thing to point out is that diversity, when it is heard in Korean society, usually comes in from the diaspora and from, um, from people overseas that return to Korea and that have um, participated in their startup culture or otherwise provide a diversity of view. Um, South Korea also, South Koreans at a very personal level, there's uh, a need for security that is reflected in choices that gravitate towards stability and, and sort of very, um, it's reflected in their career choices. In Russia, um, a, a, the legacy of the Soviet Union is still a very strong factor of their culture. There is a mistrust of the government to the extent that success is viewed as resulting from connections, not from um, uh, sort of uh, success in entrepreneurship. And there is a, a, a fear of standing out in any way. And overall, many of these things influence the way innovation happens, whether it happens overtly or sort of um, under the radar of the government. And finally, Brazil, uh, one sees a very high expectation of protectionism from the state and the belief that the state will continue to help countries and society prosper. So that's both at a societal and an industrial level. The second condition that we look at is how does innovation governance and framework condition, um, how do these two factors impact how a country is able to uh, move ahead in its innovation goals. Um, here by framework conditions, we mean things like um, trade and tax laws, intellectual property protection, infrastructure, uh, sophistication, all of the things that um, make firms efficient, lower the cost of doing business, um, and, and help the domestic industry succeed. So, so South Korea um, has succeeded in its governance, it has instituted ambitious policies backed by consistent and targeted funding. Um, the framework conditions are mostly strong. Uh, a couple of things to point out are that because of the very strong and close ties between the top industrial houses and the government, there is sometimes a perception of favoritism or corruption that goes with it. Also in South Korea, the small and medium sized enterprises have not reaped the benefits of government policies in, pro in the same proportion that big um, companies have. We see this across the board in all the three countries. In South Korea, it does stand out because of the overall sophistication of the economy, particularly in, uh, among the big companies. Um, Russia, what we have seen is that uh, they have followed, they are trying to follow a top-down 
model of innovation policy through um, special economic zones and innovation centers. However, the policies thus far do not address the underlying weaknesses and do not address the immaturity of the market conditions, which would allow uh, innovation to happen in a more bottom-up manner, which is the way it usually happens in other parts of the world where it's successful. Um, the framework conditions across the board by most indicators are weak, and they are largely not addressed by innovation policies thus far. Uh, in Brazil, the policies are relatively new. They've had mixed results, as we've seen. The framework conditions are weak. One of the weakest is the very high cost of doing business, one of the highest in the world, and that is one of the biggest hurdles for um, Brazilian businesses. Uh, the Brazilian government sometimes tends to address this um, weakness through protectionist policies, which sort of makes it a cyclical and uh, a, a cyclical solution and does not really address the problems. However, the policies overall are trying to make headway in, in looking at long-term solutions. Looking at education and workforce development, again, um, South Korea is a, a success story. It has a high, highly developed education system. There has been, over the past decade, and, but even before that, a very high emphasis on acquiring education overseas. South Korean um, students are the um, highest, you know, the highest percentage of uh, students going uh, per capita going overseas for education, primarily to the U.S. Um, recently, there's an increasing emphasis on moving towards a problem-solving sort of curriculum and away from a more traditional mode of rote memorization. As um, business, as I'm sorry, political and education leaders start recognizing the fact that innovation and competitive competitiveness going forward sort of depends on more of a problem solving act activity or curriculum and um, the rote memorization which helps you excel in engineering skills may not be um, may not be everything in russia the soviet era strength in stem education have been really eroded by mass emigration but strengths still exist and they are being um, used by foreign companies that are setting up R&D activities there. Um, there has been a sort of breakdown of the education system, which makes it hard to gauge your capability by the numbers. And there is a more recent recognition of um, the, the relative low levels of business education, and that is being uh, worked on in, in, in the recent years and in recent policies. And finally, Brazil, um, has had many uh, education successes in the past decade. Uh, there was the attainment of universal childhood education, which is a huge win for Brazil. Um, there was a push on college graduation rates and policies are moving in the right direction. And finally, recently, programs to send students overseas as they look at other countries and recognize the need for outward engagement. I just wanted to show um, some data that gives you an idea of how the countries are moving up um, in terms of their publication and citation counts. The top left graph shows the government count for country rankings. These uh, rankings are based on publications in the Scopus and Web of Science database. So it reflects what those two databases capture, but they are fairly reflective of the science and technology literature, uh, mostly English language, um, that is um, uh, sort of, that is recognized by most of the um, scientific communities in the world. And so you can see South Korea and Brazil, sort of a steady ascent, Russia uh, uh, along with China. It was too tempting to not point that out. Um, Russia is slowly declining um, in, in both the charts. Uh, just a quick bit of data. The graph on the top left is uh, put up there to show you um, South Korea's, uh, really the one that I wanted to point out was South Korea to give you an idea of how they have slowly built up their, hu um, their human capacity in science and technology. Uh, the graph shows researchers per million population and um, while Russia and has sort of declined in that time in its proportion of researchers, Brazil is slowly growing, but South Korea's sort of emphasis on that growth of intellectual capacity is, is pretty striking during that period. 
the bottom right graph shows um, the actual uh, number values just because there are such large disparities in uh, populations in these countries. But, and you can also see um, Brazil, even though it is, um, it has the lowest number of people with university degree, then the numbers are really increasing uh, with respect to past counts. And so the policies are moving in the right direction. <coughs> so almost to the end, um, industry participation in R&D based innovation is a very important aspect in the success of national innovation systems. What we have seen is that South Korea leads in BIRD, which is business expenses on R&D, as a percentage of GDP. However, the BIRD is concentrated in very few firms. In fact, the top four companies control or contribute to about 70% of the overall country's R&D budget. In Russia, the industry participation is very low in R&D type activities, as we've seen, despite having patenting rates that are comparable to OECD countries. And that can really only be attributed to a very underdeveloped commercial sector that is not able to capitalize on the intellectual property. And policies so far do not address this. Um, in Brazil, a, state, a tradition of state-supported development plus protectionist policies in response to foreign trade have created a long-term disincentive for most of the domestic companies to invest in R&D based um, in innovation and R&D type activities that push the technological edge. Brazilian firms are doing well, but they are not pushing for global com competitiveness. They are not pushing for leadership beyond the domestic economy. Um, Brazilian firms are also relatively vertically um, integrated. There is a low involvement in global supply chains outside of the oil and gas sector and a couple of other sectors. And this is becoming a concern <coughs> because of increasing trade with China and because of Chinese firms' <coughs> ability to integrate into the Brazilian <coughs> supply chains when the reverse is not very easily true. And so Brazilian um, politicians and the business leaders have started really thinking about how they can um, resolve these problems in their own favor. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, in all three countries, one does see that the benefits of government policies are uh, reaped disproportionately by the big companies that are at the top of the economy. Um, some data. The graph on the top left shows business expenditure on R&D as a percentage of GDP. And you can see um, South Korea has really taken off in the last 10 years. Um, Brazil is low but climbing. And Russia looks like um, it's not bad. It's sort of in the ballpark of the lower OECD countries. However, when you look at the bottom right graph, which shows the percent of business expenses in R&D, that are actually just financed by industry as opposed to financed by the state or non-profit sectors, Russia is much lower than most countries um, in the OECD and e the countries that are even uh, below the OECD rankings. So by all accounts, most of the countries um, that are at Russia's level of technological sophistication, um, the percent of bird financed by industry is at least 70% and up. Russia is much lower. And again, that is that reflects a really low interest in the domestic sector to invest in the R and D that is um, that is still that is still present in the research in um, research institutions and universities. Um, the final trend um, that I will discuss uh, is research industry linkages and what is the uh, research of supply supply to industry. Um, what, what is the flow of talent and personnel? In South Korea, there was a period in the 1980s and 90s where there was very close collaboration between industry and uh, public research institutes. Since then, uh, the uh, private industry has moved ahead and the public research institutes are actually now looking, sort of looking for a new role to play. And by all accounts, the investments are planned for big science areas, space, and some um, defense areas. In terms of research or supply, the best and the brightest students in South Korea 
seek employment at the biggest companies, um, thereby just making them um, sort of closer to a leadership position. In the bargain, the small and medium companies are, are sort of um, have a lack of talent. They have a hard time finding, employing, and retaining um, talented folks. In Russia, once again, um, the research institutes are disconnected from the production sector. And um, in terms of employment, the, it's the government research institutes and the state own enterprises that attract the top talent and the rest of the country <coughs> finds talent in short supply. In Brazil, there is a significant gap in university industry linkages and it always has been that way. Much basic research that's conducted in the universities that is reflected in a rising uh, rate of publications is not being transitioned out of universities. And this is uh, sort of a critical point that speaks to a business, a lack of interest in investing in R&D. There aren't many connections to universities outside of a very few sectors. And so there isn't a connection to the research, both basic and applied, that the universities could then uh, develop into products. Finally, most PhDs join academia because there is a low demand in industry for researchers. And so the problem sort of continues to uh, propagate. Um, one more point that I wanted to touch on, uh, and because this is uh, innovation that we're looking at, is um, the startup economy in these two different countries and sort of what is the sort of support for entrepreneurship and startup companies in new industries or high-risk areas and high-risk ideas. Across the board for the, three uh, for the three countries that we studied, this factor is low. Um, in South Korea, the conglomerates are so dominant, it is difficult for any industry or startup ecosystem to flourish unless they work in an area or they are targeting an area that is completely outside the interest of the big business houses. However, very recently, over the last five to seven years, a small um, startup industry is growing based on internet-based companies. This is mostly led by foreign returned or US returned Korean um, citizens. In Russia, uh, IT-based economy is the one place where innovation is happening, and, and which is why I sort of wanted to talk about it. Um, in Brazil, a startup culture and a startup ecosystem, again, is very small and is just starting to develop with a private venture capital and angel networks formed in the last couple of years. Um, I wanted to talk about information and communication technologies because it is a growing force um, in economies all over the world and it will continue to be a growing force in how countries innovate. Um, information technology enables uh, non-production, knowledge-intensive sectors in goods and services. Um, it allows uh, countries and companies to tap into human capital wherever it is available. Mobility is not a problem. Um, for countries where bureaucracy hampers uh, progress or where bureaucracy creates adverse conditions, uh, information technology has a very small footprint and, uh, and can grow quickly under the radar. Uh, it has a growing role in the, in, in the informal economy, particularly in services. It's growing faster than it's sort of being documented or measured in many ways. And finally, it has the potential to serve as a platform for many future modes of innovation. So um, I wanted to point out the information sec um, technology sector in Russia. It's the one place where a bottom-up innovation economy is growing without any help from the government, but instead with help from private venture investment. And the one place where successful entrepreneurs are turning venture capitalists and helping others, financing other companies, and, and sort of helping an innovation ecosystem to boom entirely in, in the private sector. In Russia, uh, in, uh, innovation economy uh, technology has also enabled an informal service uh, economy, which is very helpful in places where mistrust of formal institutions exist. A company uh, called QV sort of uh, functions as a reverse ATM machine where you uh, put uh, money into a card um, just, just using this com uh, company's equipment. And um, other companies that have adapted their services that 
sort of uh, use um, the same philosophy as US companies, but have adapted their service models to account for the distrust in formal institutions and find a way to provide services to people without having to touch or without having to go through the formal institution. And that's something that has a chance of having success in many other parts of the world. Finally, Brazil has a very large um, IT market, though it is mostly domestic. It's the world's fifth largest market. With many technology parks and collaborations, the industry is doing well. However, so far there is no uh, globally competitive firm coming out of Brazil. So in summary, what I would uh, like to say about these three countries is South Korea has really reached a leadership position through technological sophistication. Today, in the several sectors where it leads, it is uh, its companies are the world's leading companies. The challenge for um, the South Korean leadership now is to think about maintaining their leadership and a sort of the long-term strategy. And, and you know, once you reach the edge of technological sophistication, what should you invest in to, to carry on to the next step and to continue to stay ahead of your competitors? Um, the leadership recognizes that this uh, is going to take high-risk ideas and investment in big science. They're also aware that a tradition of consensus-based policy planning is not conducive to the sort of bottom-up innovation that has been successful in the rest of the world, and, and that is something that they are trying to address. In Russia, governance and framework conditions are the big thing for the government to address, um, but notwithstanding that, there is a growth of the IT sector, sort of uh, under the radar of the bureaucracy. Also increasing investment by multinationals is, is using the intellectual capacity of Russian uh, science and technology um, engineers in, in R&D and R&D type activities increasingly. And finally, Brazil's challenge is going forward in many of its leading industries is to transition from regional dominance um, to global competitiveness. And with increasing trade with China and the concerns that come with it, um, that uh, transition sort of may not be an option for much, much longer. Uh, the business leaders are urging um, policymakers to start thinking about ways that Brazilian businesses are forced to start becoming more globally competitive. <coughs> and my last slide, I just wanted to um, point out some overarching trends that came out of our learning from this project. What are the things, looking at all the data that we um, had from these countries, looking at everything that the experts told us, what did we learn was essential for a country to be innovative and to be successful in their innovation uh, strategies and policies? So the first thing we learned was that governance, the role of governance and culture are both very fundamental to uh, a, how a country innovates and how successful or unsuccessful it is. Um, education is important, but equally important are linkages between the research community and the industry. <coughs> business interest and business investment in innovation is essential for um, innovation to move forward for a country to become more sophisticated um, in its uh, economy because innovation ultimately is a firm-centric activity. In the three economies that we saw, which were all, um, which all had top-down planning, one does see a divide between big firms and the small to medium uh, size enterprises. Uh, the reward of uh, economic success and the advantages of policy seem to have gone somewhat disproportionately to the bigger firms uh, with respect to the smaller and medium enterprises, which are hard to, harder to target uh, <coughs> from the sorts of policies that we've seen implemented. And finally, two forces, uh, two growing forces that uh, we believe would, would continue to be important or increasingly important in how countries, uh, countries innovate. Uh, the first is information technology and as a platform for um, knowledge and service intensive sectors. And finally, multinational corporations and their global investment, as their investments in different countries move up the chain from low-end and manufacturing 
to a more high-end value-added R&D type activities, that would make a difference in increasing uh, a country's capacity and increasing their endowments from the um, perspective of innovation. That's all I had, thank you. All the reports, um, a lot more information is in the reports. We really had to condense for this talk. Uh, the reports and all their detail can be accessed at um, Ida City's publications website. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions by email as well. Thank you. Very shortly, I'm going to invite an outstanding panel to join us here on the stage. But Nayani had asked me to make sure that I save two or three of the toughest possible questions for her before we go to the, the panel and the others who contributed to this report. Well, first, I want to thank you for a terrific thank presentation. Uh, having read the reports myself, I thought you just beautifully summed them up okay. and posed individual challenges and strengths for each of the separate economies. Let me ask you first the, one of the other questions you posed but didn't dwell upon, which is as these systems in Russia, Brazil, South Korea, and elsewhere around the world, as innovation systems uh, develop, what are the challenges that they pose for the U.S. economy and what are the opportunities that they pose? I think, um, from the perspective of the U.S. economy, one of the things that uh, we, we learned through the course of this study and from talking to experts is different countries look at innovation in different ways. They, they want different things out of innovation, and um, they approach innovation uh, sort of, you know, I I in, in different ways. And one of the, I wouldn't say challenges, but one of the things that I think it would be beneficial for us to understand is perspectives of different countries and what they do to pursue their goals, which may not necessarily be the same in the same parallel framework as the United States views innovation and the way that the United States uh, goes about pursuing innovation goals. The one difference that we saw was of course, the three uh, countries that we looked at were top-down planned economies. And these, the countries like South Korea, once they sort of get to get as far as they can get through planned economies, they realize that to get further, you have to take risks and you have to make investments. You have to diversify your investments. So I think the one lesson to take from this is the U.S. perspective of diversifying investments of not really planning and strategizing innovation is, is, is a winning strategy. Um, as far as concerns, I think some of the things to watch for are sort of global investments. Uh, multinational corporations make global investments, where they're investing in, what they're tapping into, and what sort of talent or other capital comes out of the countries that one had not anticipated uh, is, is something to think about. And it is such a reality that science has already long been a global enterprise, mm -hmm. and increasingly technology is, as you have in all of the advanced industrial countries, genuinely global companies, companies that now are not just multinational but really see themselves as global in the way they think and the right. way they invest. One of the things that you stress, which often gets overlooked, I think, when we, we examine innovation systems is the role of culture. And often people say in the U.S. context that we're good at taking risks, that in the classic mm -hmm. Silicon Valley world, failure is not trying again. Uh, the people point right. even to our bankruptcy laws at facilitating that. I remember as an example story by a high-tech business friend visiting Japan going through a plant and seeing a particular employee just really being 
heavily criticized and asked for a translation of what was going on. And his translator said, well, the employee is being criticized for not only having made a serious mistake, for, but having embarrassed 700 centuries, of <laughs> 700 years of ancestors. So how do you, if a culture is critical, how do you change a culture? Well, one of the things is what I think the Koreans have been trying to do is just really look outward. Um, they have one of the more condensed homogenous cultures in the world. And the way they've trying to they've been trying to sort of balance that um, out is to send people out at younger and younger ages to to be educated in other countries to in different ways and through different programs to uh, sort of participate in, in cultures in different countries. And, um, oh, thank you. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so I think outward engagement is one of the most uh, sort of valuable activities that a country can undertake to understand other cultures, to, to imbibe more from other cultures and um, sort of counteract things in their own culture that might be holding them back. That's right. You also stress the importance of SMEs, and particularly we think of the startups that right. we're just about to issue a report here. Let me give a small plug, small mm -hmm. advertisement called uh, Small Businesses, Big Business in the United States. And part of it is, of course, that there's an enormous percentage of US, the U.S. population that works for small businesses, roughly 50 percent. But the focus is often on that 5 percent or less of small businesses that are today startup and tomorrow's Google and mm -hmm. so forth. We're beginning to pay more attention to a situation in which the number of startups has really dropped and why is that and what should we do about it? What advice would you give your three countries to foster more uh, of the, not just small businesses, but uh -huh. that SME that really can transform an economy o o over the future? Um, so, as, as far as sort of this, the startup and the private, uh, I mean the, the startup and the, and the very small company entrepreneurship goes, what we did see in these three countries is um, when policies, when government policies were trying to address uh, the question of new business, new uh, industries or startups, it was less successful than when private funding uh, was applied and private you know, angel networks and venture capital funding coming out of the private sector um, was more effective in helping. So South Korea's um, startup economy actually started moving forward once the diaspora Koreans started putting in their own money, educating um, the folks that are, you know, starting the startups and sort of mentoring and helping them. Um, the same in Russia. And uh, I would say that is starting up in Brazil. It hasn't happened yet. Um, in terms of uh, small and medium enterprises, I think it is the disadvantage, it is an added disadvantage being a top-down planned economy that um, the government is trying to, uh, trying really hard to grow certain sectors and, and not all sort of get equal attention or not get, not all get the equal rewards. And I think, uh, I mean really to counteract that, I think it would be sort of, uh, South Korea is starting to actually target policies for small and medium companies. They started um, financing incentives. Um, tax incentives are something that are widely used, um, not necessarily more effective. What two countries that have been succe really successful in sort of helping their small and medium um, enterprises are Taiwan and um, Singapore. And the two things that they have done differently from South Korea is they have, from the very beginning, uh, encouraged their small and medium enterprises to be export-oriented and to uh, sort of integrate into global supply chains in the same intensity as they push their larger companies. So today, Taiwanese and Singaporean and Hong Kong's small and medium companies are far more competitive than those of South Korea. And so as, as countries continually, sort of the big companies move from you know, one low cost country to another, South Korea's own big companies are moving away from their SMEs um, to more competitive companies in Taiwan 
and, and other low cost places because they have they are more technically sophisticated having been more competitive from um, much much longer ago well and, and finally what are your next steps do you have other innovation systems in your headlights things that you want to ask about say Thailand or Finland or another set of right. countries so I think uh, we would love to do more studies on innovation I think a couple of areas that uh, would be interesting to look at in more detail would be sort of the, the education systems um, of different countries. Um, you know, what, uh, not so much by the numbers, which is what we did here, but more the quality uh, at the high school level and at the postgraduate level. What, uh, you know, sort of at the output end, what do you see? And what is sort of the value added of that education to the economy? Um, so, and, and, and other factors, I think many of the factors that we looked at um, can be an entire study on its own. Well, thank you very much. Let me please invite the panel to join me on the, on the stage. And while we're waiting for them to come up, I want to add a special thanks to Elizabeth White, Liz White, raise your hand, Liz, who really made sure that all of this came together in an effective way. And of course, to John Tyler and his AV team, which are just so outstanding. Why don't you come over here and let me uh, put you all center stage here. Let me briefly introduce the uh, panel. Uh, let me start with uh, uh, Dr. Christopher Weber, who's on the far, your far right there. He has uh, an expertise in civil and environmental engineering. He has uh, quite a strong background in that particular uh, subject, a very outstanding educational background that includes two degrees from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and then uh, let me introduce next uh, James Herrera. Raise your, if you raise your hand. We sort of figured out who you were, but the <laughs> he uh, comes to the uh, with a background really uh, interestingly in linguistics and Slavic studies. And like so many people who probably had studying the Soviet yeah. Union in mind, he's adroitly adapted to a whole different uh, environment. And really, uh, in addition, has some. How does technology work in the field in a very sensitive way with uh, three combat tours to Iraq and, uh, and elsewhere in the, uh, in the Middle East? And then finally, but certainly not last, uh, Ms. Pena, Vanessa Pena, who uh, has a mix of economics and political science degrees, one from Columbia and one from the London School of Economics. Economics, as an economist myself, I can say has become one of the most reviled professions in Washington, but she's doing her best to restore the standing of the profession. And she is uh, one of the many things that's interesting, particularly when you think about Brazil. She's done a lot of work on biofuels and looking at alternative fuels in general. And I would say that the biofuels system in Brazil is one of their most uh, notable uh, innovative successes. And I remember visiting a research facility in Piracicaba where they said that they had commercialized 100 different strands of sugar cane. They had a seed bank with 5,000 different seeds, and they were doing genetic engineering and working closely with the universities. One of those sort of exceptions right. that kind of proved the, the rule that you pointed out. Well, let me invite you all just to make a brief statement about the study and anything else you'd like to add, and then we'll open it up to the, uh, the audience for their questions. Why don't we start all the way to the left and then move uh, to the right. Uh, sure, thanks a lot. Um, so I worked primarily on the uh, Brazil side and uh, I just wanted to point out that one of, the, one, of the main one of the main things that came through to me as one of the main findings here is, uh, is the kind of is the contrast between Brazil uh, Brazil is a country of a lot of different contrasts, both regional, uh, the southeast and so Sao Paulo in, in particular is, is seen as a very innovative part of the, of the, uh, of, of the economy. Most of the glo globally, uh, globally linked uh, enterprises are, are down there. Uh, and s there is a lot of disparity as well as uh, Naini mentioned between the kind of multinationals and the small and medium enterprises in, in, in Brazil. Um, one of the most important contrasts though that, that, that I saw and that I was really interesting to me looking through <coughs> this is the, the sort of innovation policies. Uh, there was a big chart, the eye candy that uh, Naini showed that they've that the administrations have done since the late 90s, 
um, and all of the th all of the things they have done, and a lot of experts as well as a lot of um, a lot of scholars have said a lot of what they've tried to do, you know, has really gone in the right direction. Uh, the policies have really pushed uh, pushed the right kinds of levers. Uh, but that contrasts with the macroeconomic situation on the ground, and that uh, particularly the protectionist policies that have been put in place uh, through the kind of traditional reliance on import substitution model of development there, uh, as well as really high tax rates, uh, inflexible labor, uh, labor laws, uh, and incredibly high interest rates, uh, about 10%. Um, the contrast between the kind of right the intentions and the uh, reality on the ground, I think, was kind of the, the main, one of the main interesting findings that, uh, that I uh, saw. Vanessa? Sure. Thanks. Um, so I also worked on the Brazil part of the study. And I think one of the main things that I came away with was um, a sense of hope uh, for where Brazil is going and, and its positioning for the future. So as Chris mentioned, it has more or less over the past 20 years done um, so much in terms of innovation policies. It understand The government understands very well that innovation is part of their economic growth, part of uh, their future. And so, um, but I think you come up against a wall and in in many of the barriers that Nayani pointed out in, in uh, her presentation, uh, the culture aspect, the lack of entrepreneurship, um, really the, the lack of university and industry linkages. Um, but to a certain extent, I did come away with hope because you see, as Ken also pointed out, some of those exceptions to those rules. Um, so you see a lot of uh, interactions in oil and gas industry between um, large companies, Petrobras, uh, consortia, com uh, collaborations, uh, both domestically within their supply chains as well as internationally. Um, so you, uh, the Rio Technology Park is, uh, is um, uh, constantly a, a, a source of new uh, foreign direct investments and um, research and development there. And uh, Campinas is another example where you see aeronautics uh, and um, a relationship not only with uh, academia but with, uh, but with their aeronautics industry. Ember Air has um, done a lot in terms of connecting back to uh, the STEM workforce through the Aeronautical Institute and um, being able to make those connections uh, will help them in the future uh, stay competitive. Um, so I just wanted to point out a couple of those examples, and we mentioned several others in, in the reports. I ho do hope that you take a look at those. Um, but it, that, that really is one of the aspects that I think is, is really, it's too soon to tell where these policies will go, but it is positioning itself well over the long run. James? Hi, um, I worked primarily on the uh, Russia sector with uh, Sarah Nash, um, who's not here right now, but uh, one of the major takeaways from the Russian innovation section uh, is really their ability to innovate outside of the national innovation system framework. Their, their workarounds, their, their ability to understand how difficult it is to operate within the structure that's already set in place and being addressed by various policies and coming away with uh, what we call marginal innovations, or I believe you term marginal actors in, uh, in innovation. Right, in the margins of Right, and uh, it, it's it's kind of amazing. One of the uh, more recent events that occurred actually yesterday that kind of highlights this is um, their premiere of their first smartphone. It's Russia's first smartphone, uh, a company called Yoda Devices. And uh, what's interesting about this is that the idea, the concept, um, was only possible because they operated outside of the large state-owned corporations and were, were able to start their own private company by moving away from uh, the company or the state-owned corporations, Ross Technology. They were able to move away from this, start a private company, um, and they were able to uh, get manufacturing in Singapore and China and uh, Taiwan and were able to develop this device and now they're putting it to market yesterday. So it's kind of amazing how, and then there's other examples we stated, but uh, their ability to work around the system. Well, thank you very much. And just let me, as we open it up for questions, mention that uh, here at the Wilson Center, our Brazil Institute recently hosted a group of legislators from Brazil, all focused on the U.S. innovation system, what they might learn, what they might adapt to their conditions. 
And more recently, the Mexico Institute did the same thing, a group of legislators very focused on innovation and how they might adapt their system to current world conditions. So I think what you're doing is really just right on target and very important for our understanding of where the world is going. Well, let me open it up for questions from the audience. The, the gentleman there, we have microphones coming around, then the gentleman way in the back and the lady almost in the front. If you could please introduce yourself. Hi, Rich Engel from the National Intelligence Council. My question has to do with um, cap capitalism, specifically venture capital. I did not see in your national innovation system where venture capital was. I'm sure it's in one of those three that you talked about. I'd be curious to that. But one of the questions about getting small, medium enterprises over the top and really taking off is their access to venture capital so they, c they can grow. And is it fair to say from what I heard that you would judge all three of these countries as not really doing that very well, getting venture capital to small and medium companies? Rainy, do you want to start? And then yeah. We'll ask the right. So um, I'm going to start with uh, South Korea. And what I will say is that in recent years, they have recognized how significant the disconnect is in terms of uh, being able to take advantage of um, national policies between the big firms and the small and medium firms. The realization has come when the small and medium firms started falling behind in competitiveness uh, relative to uh, surrounding countries. And um, what, what one hears about the Korean story is that policies that are targeted to the small and medium firms that are in the supply chain of the large firms essentially are being somewhat opposed by the large firms because the large firms now enjoy the position a huge advantage in having sort of lockdown supply relationships. And this is, I, I'm talking about sort of more the tech economy and more the small and medium enterprises that are locked into supplier relationships. It becomes disadvantages for the larger companies and so they've lobbied for, uh, for not having many of these policies being, be successful. So there's, uh, there's that tug of war. However, um, there is enough dissatisfaction and, and the, the, the gap is apparent. So more and more policies are being put in place. It's, it's in the last three or four years. A lot of it has come in the form of tax breaks. Um, it has come in the form of, uh, it, it's called sort of a technology, something like a technology credit where um, proportionate to the amount of innovative or sophisticated technology uh, a company develops, they're able to obtain credit. So in a sense, not for sort of growing, but for getting better. Um, so, so that's the story. Uh, it's hard to see on the output side what has actually happened in terms of helping the companies. Um, for Russia, I'm just going to quickly start off and answer and then sort of let James pick up. Um, in Russia, uh, you know, it, it's beyond the small and medium companies. Many of the companies have uh, a hard time accessing um, adequate financing um, to be successful. Uh, what we've seen is the success story is in uh, the information technology sector because it's um, sort of folks helping folks. The folks that have come up first and, and made a lot of money are now generating, um, they, they, you know, they have the Digital October and similar venture um, hubs completely online that are funding new um, IT startups. So what I've seen be successful is sort of private venture funding. The public venture funding um, is through the Russian Venture Corporation, RVC, and they are uh, targeting strategic sectors. They are trying to be successful by incorporating outside Russia, um, in the US, in Delaware, and in sort of, you know, looking for talent in the US, incorporating in the US, but trying to have their facilities in Russia. And I think a part of the story is they're trying to circumvent bureaucracy and that's taking some work. But I'll let James that's, add that's to that. That's uh, exactly what it is in Russia. The, um, the, the idea is for them to focus on uh, a broader range of innovations, but currently they, um, through companies like Russian Venture Corporation, State Setup Corporation, uh, and other types of uh, venture capitalists, they're only really looking at specific uh, strategic areas that they think will guarantee them a return on investment. If they don't see a return on that investment, they're not going to just throw forth money on um, 
on any great idea for the sake of innovating uh, these uh, incubators and, and uh, set up uh, techno parks. Um, because of this, uh, have, there's really been a, an untransparency of how things are being funded, and uh, these techno parks like Skolkova or whatnot are un, um, unpopulated. They're, they're very low population, and they're just not putting out the output that um, was expected from them in the policies. The, the one last uh, sort of thought I wanted to just add on to this is another factor for Russia is um, the isolation from the larger economy of these efforts. Um, information technology has not suffered that because it's growing in a more grassroots way, but any production-based um, economy, uh, a, a challenge will be to connect these small efforts that they're starting, however much money they put into it, but ultimately for it to uh, for technology development and for it to be a commercial, you know, appear in the commercial marketplace, there have to be connections to a larger economy that can support that, and and so there is an absence of that, which is is also a problem that will be there. That's right. Quickly, quickly in Brazil, not to belabor this point that it's difficult to uh, answer the question for three countries very uh, quickly. Um, if I had to give a two-word answer, the answer is not yet. Um, th this, uh, this has been a specific focus of the innovation policies over the last 10 years. There's, um, there's several programs that have been set up through uh, the Brazilian Innovation Agency, FINEPI, uh, including the PRIME and INNOVAR programs that have both specifically tried to target uh, public venture. Private venture is uh, very nascent uh, and it has just not set up, again, because of these macroeconomic problems. If you have a 10% uh, in, in, uh, uh, interest rate, you better be darn sure that your innovation is going to work. Uh, the risk premium is just very, very high, so it's, it's tough to break through that barrier. The gentleman way in the back. Uh, James Sang, uh, two quick questions. One, could you be a little bit more explicit when you talk about uh, top down and bottom up? I mean, everybody's favorite SME patient is now Germany, and your Fraunhofer's and your and all the other stuff seems to be an interesting mix of top down and bottom up. So I'm wondering whether th that distinction is so clear. And, and secondly, on uh, when you talk about diaspora, um, as a person in solid state who spent a lot of time in solid state physics and uh, device physics, uh, Korea is characterized by a large return diaspora. Uh, uh, Russia, as far as I know, the very I, I think I know one or two Russians who came to America for PhDs who have gone back to Russia. So the one question has always been: Do you look at the diaspora as providing, you know? particular pieces of technical knowledge so that the so that your local system runs better or do you think of diaspora as kind of a uh, cultural bomb to where you pe have people who have experience from the outside and ways of doing things completely different so is it a little incremental thing so the diaspora has produced big benefits uh, when you're you're addressing me when you're just referring to the diaspora were you saying South oh, Korea I, I uh, okay um, did you wanna yeah, I, I can start the, the diaspora question since I sort of mentioned it primarily in the context of one country. And exactly as you said, I think the reason we didn't look at it as central to, uh, you know, to the trends across the three countries, it's, it's been used much more by the Southeast Asian countries in terms of attracting return talent uh, and integrating their uh, returnees into industry and academia. Uh, as far as we know, that this is not a big uh, symptom in Russia, and in Brazil, um, n neither, uh, not, not so much in Brazil either. I think uh, in South uh, Korea, what we saw is that um, the South Korean diaspora has been used very effectively by the government for quite some time now for, for things that they see as a shortcoming in their own society and in their own thinking. They have used the diaspora to sort of reduce the consensus uh, quality of the thinking, both in academia, in policy, and in the commercial sectors. Um, I think South Korea has been one of the most successful countries in using um, their diaspora, talent in the diaspora. And we're seeing this with Russia, too. There's a, there's a growing number of uh, young professionals that are leaving the country, coming to places like the United States, getting their education, and have the intent to return back to Russia to start up their companies um, or to work for the government. Actually, they're, they're primary look, primarily looking at working in government. Uh, they see that as their uh, most successful venture, um, government or any type of state-owned corporation. 
Um, but uh, I, I think that uh, it, it's not uh, it's not quite there yet. It'll take definitely some more time. Uh, oh, in, in reference to the top down, um, I mean that's it's kind of a, a legacy question there. The you know, Russian uh, national innovation system is very much controlled from the top down, both from um, the administration uh, to, as you, as you work your way down, the, uh, the banking system, the, uh, the um, state-run corporations, uh, the uh, uh, academic institutions. Everything is, is, uh, is dictated by what the administration wants. And uh, some of these smaller... Um, organizations and companies uh, really are, are looking for ways to circumvent this. How, how can they stay out of the, the limelight, per se, and, and create the products that they want? Um, I'm not sure if, if was there something more specific you were looking at. Uh-huh. Right. And in the case of South Korea, is it really that top-down? No, no. So I, I think you know all the three countries we looked at have elements of industrial policy. I think that the difference is in degree. Um, South Korea, uh, you know, the government started off uh, certain companies on a track to sort of being successful, but today they're entirely privately managed and and very capitalistic in nature. So I guess when we say top down, it, I apologize if we've been a little loose with with the term. Um, but it's, it's very different for the three countries at, at this point in time. Anything from Brazil? Mm -hmm. The uh, lady here in the fourth row and then the gentleman all the way in the back. Yeah. Um, so my name is Sonia. I'm from Wilson Center. Uh, as you presented, um, as Ms. Gupta presented, all the, the three countries have many differences in them demographically, geographically, culturally, governmental policy, as well as the natural resources. Um, but my question is, what made your team to choose these three countries? Is there any purpose or motivation for this selection? I think the three countries were chosen because of their differences and because to some degree, between the three of them, they represent, uh, so they sort of cover a spectrum in, in having been successful or not successful in innovation. So it's more for their difference that they were chosen. And the gentleman all the, oh, all the way in the back. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Johannes Landman. I'm a public policy fellow here at the Wilson Center. Uh, on Russia, two questions. You say that there is a big gap uh, between the patents, or I think you Americans say the patents, uh, patents or patents that are registered in Russia, and the actual commercial utilization of it. I think you made the statement in the slide that the patents uh, registered in, in, in Russia are on the same level as the other uh -huh. OECD countries, but it doesn't get commercialized. Right. First of all, why do you think that is the case? Is it cultural? Is it structural, financial? Uh, would you like to speculate on the reasons? And secondly, what should be done to change that? What can be done to change that and close that gap? So all of it has to do with the academic universities and the, and the uh, academies being separated from the commercial industry so much that there, there's not a, uh, quite the cooperation there should be in order to get some of these ideas that have been patented to the marketplace. Uh, we know manufacturing has decreased. Uh, a lot of uh, small organizations are looking outside of the country for their manufacturing needs. The, um, the uh, Patents, although they have, uh, they're on par, they have been decreasing over time, and that is used as a measure of success for a lot of these um, organizations. If uh, a certain project at an academy is, is uh, not seeing the yearly output of publications, they consider that a failure. And so next year they won't receive as much funding or as much favor in terms of, of uh, their status. And so they're kind of focused on the number of patents and how much they can create and, uh, and how well they look in the eyes of their superiors. But that connection and communication with commercial industry, th they're not speaking with each other in order to get those ideas to the actual um, manufacturers or production facilities. Any Brazil thoughts? Uh, I'll, I'll just echo that again. The, the pro that problem is very similar in, in Brazil. Uh, Long-standing uh, university industry uh, kind of uh, 
mismatch that almost everyone references as one of the major barriers to innovation. Uh, tech transfer offices are, are, again, very small, only in the major universities. Uh, lots, of, lots, of, uh, lots of references out there talking about this. I'll just add to the, to the Russia answer, but more from the industry side. I think that the, the problem from, uh, you know, so, so you have the patents um, that, are, that are not insignificant. Many of them are more in sort of the, uh, the construction and machinery and processing sort of patents. But the problem is, uh, on the industry side, there's an extreme reluctance to go in the direction of commercializing patents. Uh, largely, the, the industrial structure is used to um, technology acquisition and import substitution, and that continues uh, because of the, high, the, the really high barriers, the, the very high cost of business, the low access to financing, and just the unpredictability because of, because of bureaucracy, because of an unpredictable political climate, the, the, the uh, incentive for businesses to go in the direction of R&D, which would then take them towards commercializing patents, is, is very low compared to other countries um, where the patenting rate is similar, but the uncertainty and the risks are much less. There's a gentleman with the green sweater there. Uh, and, and while we're getting the microphone, let me also want to thank Sam Benka, who's helping uh, wield the microphones here, and is our representative from Sweden here at the Wilson Center. Anwar Eridi, SRI International. My question is about the unit of analysis. As much as it's revealing to look at the countries as a national innovation system, have you considered to look at a sub-national level, on a city level? Maybe the Russian innovation system is not functioning as a national system, but St. Saint, Saint Pe uh, Petersburg could be an innovation hub. So have you looked at the city level components or the innovation hotspots in these countries and analyzed them, compared them? It's in our report. <laughs> um, in almost, I, I'll just start and then. Um, in almost all the countries, um, innovation is, is not really geographically uniformly spread. You know, in South Korea, most of the population is, is concentrated in and around Seoul, and you have sort of three distinct regions in the country where innovation happens. In Brazil, it's along the coastline, and similarly for Russia. Um, so I guess, I, I guess the, the the understatement is that um, innovation is not uniformly spread. It is happening in hotspots. It is happening in cities that have more of the tech parks, the universities, the innovation um, uh, incubators, and so forth. Um, so we have not looked, we have, in our report, we do call out um, centers of innovation. We kind of don't do an economic benefit analysis at that level. But we do call out specific places, and, and that information is there. And that, that's true for Russia. We definitely, uh, in the report, label out which uh, economic zones, special economic zones, and innovation hubs, uh, where they're located, and uh, to what extent they are in terms of growth. Um, but we don't really do a comparative analysis of individual regions over each other to see which one's more productive than the other. Mm -hmm. And similarly in Brazil, um, and I mentioned a couple of them, uh, of those hotspots and uh, technology incubation uh, areas before, um, but one of the, one of the um, areas that I wanted to point out also was that um, you, um, <laughs> sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, well, one of the areas is that there's lots of, lots of technology. Um, it, like Lenny said, there's many um, uh, centralized areas. And as we're looking at the national policies, it's interesting to see uh, the, how states have developed their own policies as well. So we looked at Sao Paulo, and many of which has very, very, very much success in that industry academic linkages. Um, and they've been implementing many of the policies that are just getting implemented nationally at that state level. So there is some bit of contrast there that's interesting to note. Um, and, and perhaps scaling you know, and learning from the experiences at that state level, taking that to the national level might be um, something to take forward. We just want to, I think that was an excellent question. In fact, we're more and more aware here that it's not a uniform innovation system, that Michael Porter is an example, has done a lot of work on innovation clusters. And almost every state governor 
is looking enviously at Route 128 and Silicon Valley and thinking about how do I create that kind of hub here. I, I remember when Tom Friedman published his The World is Flat, Richard Florida responded, no, it's not, it's spiky. And of course, that's, uh, that's a reality that we're, we're wrestling with. Is there a, another question? How about the gentleman here and then uh, the gentleman here? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm Elliot Lehman from the Defense Department. I was wondering, you've spoken mostly about innovation production. Uh, do you have any feelings about the various societies' willingness and capability to consume innovation? Does that vary? Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. No, no. <laughs> um, so again, I think we, we should all address this question, but um, I, I'll start with South Korea. It, the, tech, uh, the society in South Korea has become and is very savvy in, in their consumption of innovation. One of the things we learned sort of in our cultural learning is uh, South Koreans, because of the technological sophistication of their industry, have become imp impatient consumers of new technology. And you know, the positive is that they are likely to push um, faster development of technology and, and newer kinds of technology um, based on platforms that they are leaders in. But they are fairly sophisticated users of technology, much like the Japanese. Um, in, in other countries, it's variable. In, in Russia, it's lower, but it's, it's increasing. And uh, it, it is increasing. Um, the, the, the population is definitely technology savvy. Mm -hmm. uh, last year alone, uh, two of every five uh, cell phones that were bought were uh, smartphones. They're starting to uh, mirror us in terms of many different types of uh, social networking systems from Facebook to search engines, companies like Yandex. They, um, they, they definitely are consumers of innovation, and now they want to be part of that. They want to start commercializing products. Um, and I'll cite that smartphone again yesterday, uh, that came out yesterday. Uh, their idea was, well, let's create the first smartphone that has a screen on each side, one side digital, the other side more like a Kindle. And uh, we're going to call this our unique Russian innovation, and we think it'll change the world. And so um, that's, that's uh, their first entry into that commercial marketplace, and they, and they intend to grow on that and, uh, and start creating distribution networks. And they want to bring the manufacturing to Russia. It's just not there yet. Uh, and to add one more data point, last year there was a huge increase in the number of um, malls and the number of uh, foreign-made cars sold in Russia, and, and that's an increasing trend. So, so they're definitely consuming more. Uh, yeah, Brazil consumption side of the story is, is a very important uh, part that we, did, again, had to cut just to get, to get it into time. Uh, the growing middle class and, uh, and kind of has been a, one of the predominant economic trends over, uh, over the course of the last uh, 10 or 15 years in the, the Lula and Rousseff administrations. Um, that has, that's one of the major drivers of competitiveness for Brazil, uh, is this large market size growing middle class. And uh, that's why they have our leader in FDI, even though they have some of these structural barriers to, uh, to competitiveness uh, on, the, on the other side. I remember from my own experience in graduate school living in a neighborhood that had a very fine Italian market and a significant Jewish population. We were sure that between the Italian mothers and the Jewish mothers, we had the best food that was available in St. Louis. So that gentleman right here, and then the lady all the way in the back. Oh. Hey, uh, Tim Stakas from the Inter-American Dialogue. Um, I just wanted to, I guess this pertains more to Russia and Brazil, um, but the effect of demographic trends on the potential um, for innovation. Um, Russia, it's kind of well publicized, is kind of going through um, a demographic crisis. There's, birth rates are extremely low. Um, how does that kind of, how might that really impact their ability to generate a lot of people with these skills to really keep the economy growing, keep um, or improve on the innovation culture? Uh, similarly, in Brazil, birth rates have fallen dramatically since the 70s. So you have this entire generation that's kind of becoming into their 20s and 30s who aren't terribly well educated still. Brazil's improving its education system, but it still has a long way to go. Is Brazil missing out on its chance to really kind of take advantage of this um, population dividend, and would that affect its ability to really be an innovation center? 
Sure. Um, so with Russia, that's uh, a very well known issue. The um, the uh, the demographic concern, both in terms of uh, loss of population as well as uh, a distancing of the older generation and their uh, science and technology backgrounds and knowledge versus the younger generation who is more focused on business management and uh, and other types of service sectors. And wh what you're seeing is. Um, that they're losing a lot of the researchers and scientists that were able to produce the type of quality work uh, in science and technology that they once had. And, uh, and though they are trying, similarly like the U.S., to have different types of STEM programs in order to increase that um, capacity, it's, it's not as effective as they thought it would be because the, the generation that's coming up is more interested in, in um, being part of the business society, being uh, CEOs and, and uh, other types of the service sector. They're not as interested in, in, uh, in the science and technology background. And as a result, the quality of the science and technology that's been coming out of Russia has been decreasing um, to the point where uh, I know a lot of collaborations that, uh, that I've seen on different projects here in the U.S. with uh, Russian scientists. Uh, they question the type of work and the quality of that work and whether or not they should rely on that uh, or not. Yeah, on Brazil's side, just a couple points. Um, there have been a lot of progress made in terms of education, and a lot of the policies and social policies have really been focused on this development, um, focusing on access, less on quality. And I think the first thing is to try to get access to that education, um, implementing policies like Bolsa Familia, uh, incentives to have uh, the children attend school and not miss school. Uh, that goes to the parents. Um, things like that are, are helping push, you know, from from secondary to post-secondary, the increase in access to education and 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 fulfillment of the degrees. Um, the second point I point out is the science without borders. Uh, it was mentioned in Naini's presentation as a big education push uh, in in to train. Uh, post-secondary university graduates and train them abroad and re have that outreach, that global uh, presence, um, have uh, connections internationally, understand different cultures, and then bring that back uh, into the Brazilian society. So I think in some ways they're trying to address that throughout the entire pipeline, the entire education system through their policies. But some of those are fairly new. Again, we've seen some successes in the, in the very early stages of education, um, perhaps less so in, in the postgraduate. Well, we, we'll take one last question. The gentleman toward the back. Uh, Nanny, one of the things that I heard you call out during the Introduce yourself, please. Oh, sure. Uh, Dave Williams, um, here with the uh, USG. Uh, one of the things I heard during the presentation was that the South Korean Chabel uh, have made some risky bets in the investments they've made in innovation. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about some of the drivers of that and then some of the char characteristics they look for um, in those bets uh, besides profitability, obviously. Right. Um, I, I guess that's, that's not a very um, easy question because it's not a very, you know, it's it's not a very explicit answer essentially. Um, so, so the South Korean, you know, the rise of the technology companies has been closely modeled on uh, the Japanese, uh, you know, uh, sort of tradition. And so I guess when one is talking about risk taking, it's um, it's in the context of them sort of differentiating themselves from um, the Japanese. And so the two uh, examples I mentioned, um, actually Harvard Business uh, Review, you know, the Harvard Business case Studies and so forth have done a really good um, study on um, Samsung and perhaps one more Korean company and, and how they moved to uh, th this sort of stage of risk taking. Um, given where they started from. And the two things that they called out, which is sort of where we got some of the information for this study, is um, one was an aggressive move to pull in um, outside opinion and outside information, which, which was not easy. It, 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 it was an uncomfortable situation in the Korean corporate structure to, um, for example, bringing in um, sort of executives from the United States and putting them in very high-ranking positions in South Korean industry. 
Um, it was done. It was done in Samsung. It was done in a couple of other places. Um, it was not easy, and you know some of these uh, sort of um, ventures didn't were not very really long lasting. But I think the way that they have tried to distinguish themselves uh, from other similar company countries that you know uh, that do what they do is by bringing in outside um, opinion by promoting within the companies. In, in a different way. So they've changed organizational structure, and they've changed their organizational thinking um, by promoting on based on merit as opposed to promoting based on seniority, which is what Japanese companies do 99% of the time. Um, the leadership in these companies has rewarded risk-taking, and they've rewarded um, folks from lower levels making their opinions known. And I think, so those are, I guess, the two things that I would say. It is the insertion of opinions from the outside, and, and it's by moving to a different system of incentivizing um, actions of employees that they've managed to you know, do the risk taking that, that we see them do. Well, unfortunately, we have reached our witching hour. I do want to ask, pose one last question to our panel, who's helped produce an outstanding report and made very incisive comments. Is our own technology advanced enough to clone Stippy? Or is that uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I want to I thank the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for requesting this study, Dr. Lewis for having overseen the study, Nayani for an absolutely fabulous presentation, and a really very well-informed panel that have enriched our understanding of the innovation systems of these three countries. Would you please join me in a round of applause for just an outstanding day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank it was you. great. Thank you.